Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Uh, sorry if I sound out of the weather. I just am finishing up doing taxes, and uh, that's quite an ordeal, especially when we had uh, cashed out some retirement stuff and had to pay the full tax on it to get it out of the system. Ultimately, I'm glad that I did, uh, although it, it costs a lot. I can see from looking at the tax perspective of everything, looking backwards, that I would say that 99.5%, 99 let's say, of the people are not going to get their money out of the system before it vaporizes. It, it's just too painful. Uh, I had to pay tax on my retirement money as ordinary income. And so even with the government setting aside an enormous amount of money, I still had to pony up money on taxes. So it's extremely painful, and I expect very, very few people to do what I did. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that people are essentially trapped in the system, and uh, I think they're just going to ride the system all the way down eventually when it goes. Now, the chart we're looking at here is uh, an example of how desperate they are to keep everything together until when, that's the big if, why are they trying to keep everything together? Well, my first observation, of course, I point out many times, is that this one is the presidential cycle. It's very, very clear. Uh, there's the first eight-year presidential cycle. They finally let that fall. Here's the second one. They almost run parallel lines. And then here's the current one, uh, that they do not want to let this thing fall until the president is safely out of office and can't get the blame. That seems to me to be probably the biggest explanation of anything. Now, the period that we're looking at here is this very interesting period right here where we started off with the worst year ever. And, you know, I covered, we had Jeff Berwick. He, you know, is still on this Shemitah thing. I... I don't think that thing's going to pan out, but, you know, trying to save face, saying, oh, this is the worst start of the year. Well, they, it's pretty much recovered everything now. And a very interesting take on this is this Zero Hedge article about this Janet Yellen phone call. Now, apparently, uh, based on the logs, we'll read this here. Two weeks ago, we showed something striking while comb combing through Janet Yellen's recently disclosed daily diary we noticed that on February 11th and 12th, the Fed chair held two critical phone calls, one with BOE Governor Mark Carney and one with Mario Draghi. But what was especially shocking and the reason why we dubbed them the phone calls that saved the world is that the first call took place quite literally the very hour that the market hit the 2016 lows. And you can see there's the S&P 500 uh, just on the short term and then you can see it here on on the longer term through march and you can see that that those calls coincided exactly with the bottom and you can see what the market was doing it was actually rolling over from the january 15th uh, 16th uh, point it had basically gone straight down from the beginning of the year and and then it was rallying and it recover, uh, did about a 50% bounce and it was rolling over and about, in fact, it had just made new lows when this call apparently occurred. So, of course, they're not going to release what the call was about. And there's speculation as to, of course, you always get the speculation. Well, is the Fed subject to Freedom of Information inquiries? Uh, because they're not apparently a government body or are they and so of course they didn't release that but very interesting that that call was made now back to the market you can see let's put it on the daily here i think they said Feb february 11th so you can see yeah i think that's this one here so maybe there was a little bit uh, lower in january but it was it was rolling over it probably doesn't appear on this spike maybe this one was lower but it doesn't show on the daily candles that's possible so it was clearly rolling over going to go into new lows it was right on that trend line you can see how far back the trend line that's the presidential trend line and that would have been 
the market collapsing during Barack Obama's presidency. Remember, we had the little meeting with Obama. Now, what's interesting about this is if you remember when the Chinese stock market started to crater around the time when they were doing some things with their currency and trying a loose, uh, to loosen up the peg with the dollar, if you remember that this Chinese stock market really started to go down and there was a lot of stories about the Chinese manipulating their stock market and doing things like outlawing short selling and all this stuff. And to be honest, I am very skeptical about any news that I hear in the West about China because a lot of it's just plain lies. And so you just really don't know what to believe. But what's interesting is if we pull up a chart of the Chinese stock market, the SSE composite, you can see that for the most part, the Chinese have already let it correct. So this was the big uh, event here. And that was in the summer of 2015. And uh, the Chinese fighting it, the drops, and then you can see it, it did one rally and then finally dropped. And you can see that where it dropped to, if we go out to the monthly, it pretty much just dropped back down, not quite a full test, but close to a test of this general trend line that it's been on since really since China started to grow in this phase, which was around 1994 or so. And you can see that, you know, as far as returns go, we're talking about a move from around 500. Is that the number we've got here? We'll just say 500 as a round figure to 2000. Then you can see it was 3000. At one point it was 5000. So it had a tenfold move at one point, but it gave back most of that and for the most part, the Chinese stock market is back to its long-term trend line. Um, maybe a little bit overvalued, but not really. But when we look at the Western markets, and it's so interesting that we get so much news about uh, how everybody else is a manipulator, but nobody talks about how we're a manipulator. And we're going to look at how, how they're manipulating silver in that lawsuit when we listen to Eric Sprott. But let's go over... To, and again, and look at the Dow Jones Industrials. This is the manipulation right here. This is Janet Yellen's call to Mario Draghi and Mark Carney, uh, basically Europe and England, and England probably includes, uh, you know, whoever has the queen on the coin. So that would be Australia and New Zealand and Canada, basically the Western world, all the central bankers joining together to buy stocks. Uh, I, I think it's very clear that that's exactly what they did. And yet they're the ones that accuse the Chinese of manipulating their markets. Now, does it apply to all these markets? Let's take a look at the uh, FTSE 100. And you can see on the FTSE, yeah, pretty much same thing. Not as much. You can see that the FTSE started to sell off before the beginning of the year, whereas the uh, Dow started selling off right at the beginning of the year. But the FTSE uh, continued falling off when the new year came, and then it spiked on a rally right uh, at that about the same time the U.S. market did. Same thing with the Euro next. We look at the European stock market. You can see that they were going to do the same thing that we were selling off here at this low right there. And then we got the call. So pretty clear to me that central bankers are conspiring to prop up the paper assets. Now, remember I mentioned how difficult it is to get out of their paper system. That's how they want it. I think they because they plan to collapse the whole thing all at the same time. They want everybody on the same sinking ship. Uh, they don't want anybody to be outside of the sinking ship. Of course, that's the same reason that they manipulate paper markets to the upside is the reason that they manipulate the metals markets to the downside. Now, here's uh, Craig Hemke or Turd Ferguson, TF Metals, interviewing Eric Sprott. I'm going to listen to a little bit of this uh, Eric Sprott's take on this silver manipulation. So I have an exciting week. I might have hoped for a little more excitement in some of the markets here with some of these revelations that we're going to discuss. But uh, 
time will see whether it's a, it's a, a significant turning point or not. Yes, very big news yesterday, and I, I can't wait to get your opinion on it. The news that uh, Deutsche Bank had agreed to settle a lawsuit regarding silver fixing and silver manipulation and price rigging. And uh, most significantly, it looks like they're turning state's evidence and, and helping the uh, helping the prosecutors and the different justice departments involved. What do you think of all this, Eric? Well, Craig, as you know, uh, those of us uh, that sort of have sided with the GATA camp have realized all along that there are forces at work in the silver market that have nothing to do with supply and demand. We've had to witness very, very weird trading patterns in both silver and gold. And by the way, Deutsche Bank's also um, admitted to manipulating the gold price. Now, we haven't had any details of these things. We don't know what the fines are. The turning state's evidence will be very interesting because much like uh, LIBOR and Forex, these guys operated through chat rooms where they'd send, uh, you know, the emails to each other suggesting where they wanted the price to go, and it all worked collusively. And it's interesting, Craig, when you look at the structure of the uh, the COMEX, you see these huge short positions by the major banks. Uh, I think silver would push 900 million ounces short, as you know, we produce about that per year. And uh, they obviously are in it together. I, I can't imagine that one group would would be on such take such an extreme um, opposite to other groups in the market all the time, and of course it's because they they know if they act collusively, uh, they can probably make things happen that shouldn't otherwise happen. So it'll be interesting to see the information that's provided, uh, how the rigging was done, and to what extent it was done. I hope it's not just you know the they affected a few fixes on London and will give you a little slap on the wrist for doing that. Of course, the bigger issue to me is the whole manipulation when the price of gold was 1900 and went down by hundreds and two hundreds of dollars in a day. That to me is by far the bigger, the bigger question. And the whole move from 1900 down to whatever the low was, 1045 or something, which seemed totally out of place to me the whole while it was going on. I just hope that. You know, the, the, the other major banks that get ensnared in this are forced to admit it as well. And maybe someday we'll get a clean market for gold and silver. I mean, it's always been my contention for the last five years that demand for gold is way beyond the supply of gold. The same thing with silver. And that it's, it's just, just it's totally illogical that uh, prices would have done what they've done in a normally functioning market. If you had a market, not just... Uh, interventions by central banks and or their proxies. And, and there probably is some relationship of the commercial banks to the central banks. Okay, we want the price of gold down because we want our currencies to look stable, even though, I mean, it, you just look at these currencies and you wonder how we're all going to survive it because the debts just keep piling up. So that's a very good point. Um, I don't think that many people in this community doubt the the banks uh, that have been accused here of manipulating the silver price uh, and the gold price that they're acting at their own behest but they're acting at the behest of the central banks and the central banks have an interest in suppressing the price of gold and silver and propping up the stock markets. Now, if we just think about, we've had a lot of talk about the Federal Reserve and their interest rate increases and their flip-flops on that. The, the fact that the Fed would do just one quarter point increase and that they would say that for the year 2016, they had four, I think they said they had four more on the table and that they backed off that and haven't done anything, that is a tremendous blow to their credibility. Now, if we look here on the national debt clock, th these numbers aren't accurate. Obviously, you can see with the federal budget deficit being reported as 496 when we know that it's more than, uh, more than a trillion dollars, these aren't accurate. But these are the numbers that the government puts out with their fiscal year and their phony nonsense that they do. So if the interest on the debt, now I don't know what that interest rate is. I suppose that based on the yield curve and how the securities are uh, broken out along the curve, uh, I'm pretty sure that they're 
aren't that many on the longer, longer end of the curve anymore. They'd been doing away with the longer dated security. So I would bet that most of the national debt is toward the shorter end of the yield curve. And if that's the case, the interest rate is probably pretty low. Um, if the interest rate is, let's say, a half a percent overall on that, and we're paying $250 uh, billion dollars a year in interest, then if rates normalize, it's going to go tenfold. That would be at 5%, actually is low for interest rates. I think normalized rates are six or even seven. But let's just say 5%, maybe a five, uh, tenfold move. That's going to be tenfold this. That's going to be $2.5 trillion. You can see the federal revenues are 3.3. Um, so that's it. That's the entire... That's the entire uh, budget is just the interest on the debt. So that's clearly that's insolvency. So the central banks of the world and the governments that they operate for, uh, basically they're insolvent. Uh, certainly the Western ones, the United States, Bank of England, Europe, uh, the ones that we see involved in this rigging, uh, they're essentially bankrupt. And their governments are all running gigantic Ponzi schemes that are all going to collapse at the same time. So let's read a little bit of this uh, Kyle Bass, uh, Resurgence of Gold and the Run on Cash. And uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Heyman Capital founder Kyle Bass sat down recently for a conversation with Maria Bartiromo and Gary Kaminsky on Wall Street Week. He covered a variety of topics such as NERP, income inequality, and U.S. presidential race. As our regular readers know, Kyle correctly predicted the housing crisis and is now calling for the yuan to be dramatically devalued. On the growing use of negative interest rates as a central bank policy tool, he pointed out that while the central planners have their PhDs and elaborate Excel models, the reality is, not, is that not all people behave rationally. And thus, in the real world, those types of policies won't necessarily work as intended. He also touched on the fact that that a concern that should be on the front of everyone's mind is the fact that NERP goes full Shinzo Abe and banks start charging customers for keeping cash at their banks, that there will be a run on cash. Quote, I think this is where the academics are kind of clashing with the practitioners. I think on paper, negative rates make a lot of sense if you're running academic models, but in reality, they make no sense. Having seven or eight trillion dollars of debt trading at negative rates, having 30-year JGBs trading at 50 basis points is absolutely ludicrous. This experiment that's going on, we all know, will end poorly at some point in time. I just don't know when that time is. I think that one of the fears that they have is a run on cash. If they told you and I that they're going to tax your deposits by 100 basis points, well, it's better to put it in a safe or under your mattress and that's why you see a resurgence in gold. The more they move toward negative rates, the more gold is going to take off because there's no carrying cost. So, and then he goes on to talk about Asia. So, uh, again, same story here. The, the governments and the central banks are kind of in a situation of their own making. They're kind of trapped. And uh, I believe that uh, both things are true, that the Federal Reserve and the other central banks are rigging markets. They're specifically rigging the paper markets, uh, trying to keep them up, uh, certainly during an election cycle, and uh, they're suppressing the gold and silver market. So let's put uh, the cross that I put here fairly frequently between the Dow and the silver price, and I've always talked about how these are going to normalize and cross at some point, and uh, we were beginning to reach that point. You'll see when I get the chart up. We were beginning to reach that point, and then with this intervention by the central banks, uh, you can see here we were reaching the point of the whole thing coming down. Uh, we are reaching the point of silver starting to come up. But you can see the desperate uh, maneuvers by central bankers uh, at the behest of governments uh, to keep the manipulation going because I fully believe that when this house of cards comes tumbling down, 
the whole system's gonna go all at the same time. And we'll talk to you next time.